Thanks again uh, for the invitation. It's fantastic to be here and also for the chance to uh, discuss the work in the context of this um, symposium. So in, in that sense, I think um, we were talking about this in the office, thinking about how we might use this as a way uh, to survey our work of the last 10, 15 years um, and to see how these relationships might actually work in terms of ecology uh, and related uh, to more recent work and in terms of uh, digital. So I think um, in a way uh, we went back and looked at our own work historically and, and saw how uh, this might fit into this um, topic. Um, one thing, that, and one thing we were talking about last night also was this idea that um, uh, these practices and maybe practices of our generation tends to be things that are um, evolving, uh, that, that change over time, and I think also our relationship to some of these issues is, is one that, that is, in a sense, opportunistic and changing um, as we go along and, and as we move through uh, different kinds of uh, projects. So one of the things, um, when we arrived uh, in Berlin uh, about uh, 15 years ago was um, how, how could we operate as, as, as um, young architects um, in a context like this. So, um, and for us, um, it was quite literal in terms of thinking about, say, um, ecologies, how we would work um, in, in a context like Berlin where um, the center of the city was very quickly being uh, discussed and, and competitions and being planned for and built, um, whereas uh, our opportunities were really about the periphery of the city and how we might work there. So um, in this case, ecologies for us meant really uh, how do we deal with issues of reclamation or dealing with landscapes that were um, damaged or landscapes that were militarized during uh, a very complex uh, German history and how we might um, think about this uh, in an architectural scale. Um, it also meant that we could operate um, on, on initial projects at a, at a very, very large scale uh, in relationship to uh, landscapes that are, again, uh, damaged or since contaminated uh, in the context of the German Garden Show, uh, in this case, uh, an opportunity to um, reclaim these uh, landscapes in order to, it, and in relationship to uh, a moderate income uh, communities housing uh, around this area, and also close to the very sensitive um, uh, historical sites of Potsdam, Saint Souci, uh, the Gardens of Linné, uh, and the architecture of Schinkel. So, uh, in this case. Uh, our, our project was uh, this pavilion uh, next to Pierre Latz's uh, landscape gardens in the Bornsteiner Feld. Uh, this area here, which was um, a series of berms that were formed by the uh, Soviets to protect their uh, barracks that they had built there. And um, also, I think this idea of, of how architects work, what kinds of instruments um, you use, and, and for us, was the idea of using uh, an existing landscape uh, as a condition that could sort of generate uh, an architecture, f um, in a sense, for us um, to produce this. So I, th I think in a project like this, it was really um, about uh, a site-specific um, condition. It was about a building that could operate at the scale of, say, um, landscape or land art, even, which was an interest for us early on in the practice, um, and how um, the building could, in a sense, be assimilated into these uh, landscapes. Um, in a, in a physical way, but also a spatial way in terms of responding to the gardens uh, uh, next to it. Uh, to build a building very quickly, we built this in 12 months for, uh, for, for 20 uh, million euros uh, to use uh, Eastern German uh, local uh, um, crafts and, and, and um, workers, um, materials, um, processes, uh, in this case a kind of board form concrete uh, and, and simply glass, grass uh, covered uh, berms with a prefabricated roof that would float over the top of us. Um, the systems technically uh, are fairly simple uh, structure, kind of um, a roof structure with uh, um, skylights that could open up and ventilate the space and then using uh, in this in the six months garden show as a temporary pavilion for this which was later used as a, uh, a commercial used to cover the um, uh, surfaces in, in plantings and uh, had a sort of promenade or a circuit that went through the spaces uh, that allowed people to move uh, through this and, and experience um, this hall. So, um, so it was very much about working very quickly 
um, working very simply, uh, almost kind of primitive uh, construction systems in terms of uh, producing uh, this kind of project, um, which happened about 10 years ago. So a few, a few years after this project, we started to look at um, um, uh, German technology, German industry, how that might uh, inform uh, the making of a project. So um, in this case, um, and, and this, we've done a, a number of projects for this company, Trump, uh, who is a southern Germany, uh, German uh, high-tech company who makes uh, machine tools with a focus on uh, laser cutting uh, to produce uh, an office building uh, for them uh, along the, the Autobahn here, and to use um, ideas about sustainability in terms of engineering, uh, but also uh, in relationship to how people uh, work or how they occupy or use these kinds of buildings, and uh, that, that those ideas, and I think, you know, Thomas was talking about this idea too, how those ideas could be sort of mutual or supporting uh, one another, so that, um, in a sense, we produce a, a new idea for work for them, which is a, a very open loft-like uh, building. Uh, it works on a split level. Uh, the building uh, elements uh, bridge uh, a lower condition of, of uh, exhibition spaces and an auditorium. Uh, there's a series of, of uh, chimneys that ventilate it, and um, we developed a double facade system that uh, at the time, I think 2003, uh, was a way of, of controlling uh, heat and cold, but also was a way of uh, acoustically uh, separating or protecting the building uh, from the autobahn. And, um, at the same time have a kind of formal uh, identity for us for the, for the building and the making. So uh, in a way the ideas of, of sustainability or uh, the actual you know, engineering of that stuff would also uh, coincide with the actual spatial and programmatic uh, experience of the building. So, um, so these guys over here are crisscrossing these bridges which at the same time is the ventilation chimney for the building. Um, this idea of communication or uh, what work is, how it's done, uh, uh, visual communication between these split level floors, um, how that would work uh, at the same time, you know, doing these things like having the cooling uh, up in a, a, a pre-cast uh, or a, a cast in place, sorry, uh, concrete uh, ceilings of the space. Um, this is a double facade which we used for, for um, heating and cooling and ventilation of the thing that also allow these workspaces to be incredibly quiet even though they're next to this incredibly <laughs> Uh, loud uh, autobahn uh, next to it. So um, this idea of sort of complementing uh, systems at the same time with a number of architectural ambitions that could sort of pull uh, all of this uh, together. So this is, you know, the section with um, the split section idea, the, the, the chimneys working through it, uh, the heating, uh, cooling ideas, and this idea of a, a, a structural engineering, a, a bridge, a bridging uh, system of two bars that bridge across the lower, um, more public um, spaces at the, at, at the ground floor uh, of the project. Um, that would include, uh, again, a kind of integration of structural ideas in the auditorium space um, and this, this crisscrossing uh, grid of structure above it, um, exposing uh, the construction materials and, and interlacing it. So, so, you know, this it was a few years ago was sort of the approach um, that we're using in terms of starting to bring these um, systems together. Uh, most of the systems at this point are still relatively conventional construction systems uh, within the kind of uh, European uh, building scene. Um, uh, more recently, um, we began to look at their machines as a kind of start-off point, um, how we might use um, digital uh, capabilities, but also analog. It's and again, I think there is a kind of nonchalance of what tools uh, you can use. And um, this was discussed maybe a little bit earlier, but the idea of sort of lower technology or high technology, or simply um, using whatever you need or whatever you can uh, in a more opportunistic based way. Um, one of the ideas with um, uh, that was happening about this time was. Um, relationships to, to process, how do, how do you do things? So um, I, think, I think when we were students, you know, at the GSD a while ago, um, you know, it, when software arrived on the scene, it was really much about uh, kind of taking a software that would usually be specific to a kind of form making, 
uh, and then later down the line, maybe look how that would affect the material, and then uh, select a tool for doing that. So in, in the lower bar, um, and, and, and this speaks, I mean, for a lot of our current work, which is selecting material, um, thinking about a tool or a procedure, locating software uh, with that, and then seeing what kind of formal or uh, spatial results uh, that might uh, drive. So, and, and another thing is this, this idea of collaboration where um, uh, we started uh, with Trump, who was the client we were working uh, with, but in the meantime, that's, um, um, we'd added or we continued to add to that list in terms of fabricators. Uh, most of these guys are in Europe, some in Asia, uh, that usually can do a specific thing, um, and also the possibility of combining these groups uh, to produce uh, more complex um, projects. But um, also in the context of our office, which is um, about a, you know architectural practice, but is also uh, we have a research component within the practice. Um, we're also um, both uh, teaching um, to start to break out a kind of space uh, within the practice that could. Um, focus on a more experimental approach. So um, depending on a tool type or group, we started to produce elements that were in a sense one-to-one um, -one or sometimes scaleless, um, but had no particular architectural use um, from the offset. We would simply produce these things, archive them, uh, which may be activated uh, in an architectural project um, or not, depending on uh, opportunities and restrictions, and then starting to use um, situations like uh, the Venice Biennale um, to start to test these things at a, say, architectural or, or installation scale about um, how these uh, would um, aggregate or produce systems that you could experience that were spatial, you could move through, um, you could take them apart, uh, you could move them in a kind of quasi um, location between the kind of open-ended experimental work and, say, uh, the ongoing uh, building work that we were doing uh, in the practice. Um, another uh, format for doing this was the, this Atlas of Fabrication, which uh, continues to produce very simple, um, almost kind of a brochure format. Uh, this one for the, for the AA, where uh, instead of, say, showing a series of buildings, it was really s about showing a series of of uh, processes of doing something. And they were usually action um, related in terms of, say, casting or cutting or stacking or bending uh, that would produce a series of procedures. Um, at the same time, uh, could start to produce uh, prototypes uh, like this one, where we switch to um, uh, tube cutting, but in this relationship to um, uh, plexiglass. Uh, this is an installation in a, in a gallery, an art gallery. Uh, then this later became a more precise um, product for um, for the Deutsche Bank, a, a lighting piece for them, um, but in a way to um, find a kind of series of steps between these projects uh, and processes uh, to um, um, to add to the kind of building projects we're doing. And I think another idea, and this is kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit, found by, uh, that was in ICANN magazine a few years ago was um, also the idea that this technology wasn't going to be exclusive, but we could start to use it on um, everyday building types. So, which means then we continue, we're building factories, we're building office spaces, um, but trying to see um, technology or evolving merging technologies um, applied to these kinds of, of, of projects um, where it, it doesn't have to be um, exclusive. So um, in relationship to say digital processes, uh, the Cantina project, um, which is next door uh, to um, the, the, the building, the office building I showed before, um, relates to it in terms of um, urbanistically um, this space, this sort of entrance space here uh, in this kind of uh, industrial factory uh, campus. Um, but it was a very different building type. It's a kind of um, uh, standalone building. Uh, it's a, a cantina. It's also a kind of event space uh, for the for the people who work uh, in in this campus. Uh, in that sense, it's also a social space in terms of people meeting here, exchanging ideas uh, across uh, all sort of um, la um, ranks of, of, of people: white collar, blue collar workers within uh, the factory. 
Um, and it was also a, a point um, where we could start to look at, say, di digital um, uh, technologies, which before in some of these buildings simply would sort of accessorize in certain points within these buildings. But um, we were interested in looking at it where it could really start to do comprehensive things. It could start to do um, major structural systems. It could start to do uh, complex facade systems in a much more sort of um, uh, complete uh, way. Um, also, I think, I think one of the aspects, one of the conditions, um, and this was mentioned earlier, this idea of, say, uh, the ornamental or um, uh, the capacity of, of, of differentiation um, through these processes um, um, are similar to processes that we say we find in, in nature and, and we could use that. So um, in working um, in these first study models with, uh, with students in, in, the, um, in the practice, um, we would start to look at different ways of, of solving, say, a large span uh, roof problem so that each one and, and immediately there's an idea about, say, uh, wood construction in the top one, steel construction here, um, concrete construction here, and start to um, compare and test these uh, different um, solutions, uh, how they might um, work uh, with each other. Um, at this time, we started doing workshops with uh, structural engineers with Werner Sobeck, uh, where we started to look at a hybrid system of, of steel uh, for a primary structural system because uh, we wanted a, a large span, column-free uh, space, and then um, an infill material of, of glue laminated wood, which was uh, light, it's fairly easy to cut, um, and also started to thinking about uh, wood as a, also a kind of material, I mean an archaic material, but also a really a material of the future in terms of being able to retool it in different ways. Um, but uh, thinking of it as a very sustainable material, material that um, could produce ever more complex um, structural and architectural um, solutions. Um, at this time, we also started to work with Thomas's group, Transolar, uh, in terms of how that um, structural surface could have a depth to it um, that could filter natural light. Um, we could embed um, artificial light into it. We could use it as an uh, 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 acoustical surface, but also um, this idea of, of sort of front-loading all of these um, collaborations where we would start working with um, uh, these fabricators very, very early on in the process, also with the engineers in terms of coming to solutions uh, that were much, much better informed rather than coming later in the process and then asking them uh, to solve things. Um, in most of our current projects, um, we're prototyping to test systems and a lot of this has to do to see how things actually work. Um, it also has to do with dumbing down things, if things are complex or where they don't need to be or they're overly expensive. Uh, it's always a kind of device that helps us in terms of, of making those kinds of um, decisions. So uh, in this case, we could um, um, make aesthetic decisions in terms of finishes, but also uh, the mechanics of fastening, um, the speed of fabricating these things, uh, the time that it would take to get them on site, um, these guys in the Black Forest would then, uh, at the side of the shop, would start um, um, redrawing our project in a sense in terms of every component being described uh, on their, their software and hardware and then uh, going into um, um, large production cycles. So um, in, this, in this hall, um, they're producing our components um, over here, uh, which are sort of cut and numbered then brought on site in time just in time. In the other bay, uh, they were building a uh, Segoa Bands Pompidou uh, project, but in order to um, cut costs, but also uh, in order to speed up the building uh, process where um, most of these buildings need to be built and, and occupied you know, within 12, 14 uh, months. So uh, in this case, everything's coming on site, the steel's on site, um, the, this sort of lattice work of, of blue laminated uh, cells is going up. These are little sort of helper columns that are pulling the whole thing uh, together. But um, again, using the, the digital capacities to um, uh, pull a kind of, um, uh, what was this kind of a new use of, a, of an old material in, in a digitally differentiated way throughout this, this kind of matrix of sales of cells. Um, I, I think there's still some, some traces to the earlier projects in terms of landscape of, of not wanting to 
uh, create an object or a pavilion on this campus, but somehow um, um, embedding it into that landscape, uh, it's sort of excavated down to this amphitheater uh, level. Uh, the entire campus is connected by uh, a series of tunnels uh, that connected at a minus four meter level, so to drop the whole thing uh, and to create this kind of uh, swath of space uh, between um, the roof structure itself and uh, this lower level. So this is the level of the ground uh, up here. By doing that, we were able to generate this uh, mezzanine uh, condition which wraps up and around this thing and then to start to uh, assign each one of these cells a kind of functional role. It could be a skylight, uh, it could be acoustical surface, it could be uh, a series of artificial lights that we could uh, add when we needed to. Um, again, working closely with uh, Transolar uh, to target these things and to give each one of them uh, a kind of role uh, in this uh, piece on the ground. Uh, the plan is the tunnel connection, a kind of a large uh, space which they can use for um, different, different, different roles. And then this kind of uh, mezzanine kitchen space uh, over to the right. Uh, the diagram here. Uh, reflected ceiling plans showing where each of these um, sort of cell pieces um, uh, are located, whether it's a, a skylight, uh, acoustical surface um, or not. So um, starting a, a, a kind of assignment of, of a use role to each, each one of those pieces uh, as we uh, did it. So, um, and it was also, I think, I think also in this process was um, the realization, and, and for me as a kind of American trained uh, um, architect, the idea that we could actually um, design and um, produce all of the systems within the building. So there wasn't um, this idea of shopping for things anymore, but actually producing uh, the primary structure systems, producing the, the facades ourselves, uh, even producing um, the cladding um, for the, um, the base and the interior, uh, producing uh, ceramic uh, terracotta tiles. Uh, for the exterior, and then uh, producing this as a kind of um, uh, screen, screen wall base uh, of these um, convex or concave uh, uh, tiles that we could make. So um, even though the building itself is a kind of one-off, we could, we could start to control and produce the systems within an individual uh, building without having to rely on um, other systems. Uh, um, again, the kind of shopping aspect of the project and uh, bringing it to um, uh, creating this kind of a building on this campus, which also has these uh, kind of uh, exterior spaces, these balconies uh, that wrap around the English uh, uh, structural s uh, system. Um, very quickly, another building that we produced at the same time was this gatehouse. So the building I just showed you is, is in the background uh, over here. Um, the gatehouse was uh, really a chance for the, for the company to uh, demonstrate all of their technology in, in one building. So, uh, in a way, it, it's the entrance uh, to this campus for the people who work there, but also the clients who are coming there, uh, clients coming from Audi or, or from, say, Alessi, who are trying or testing their um, machines to see what they can do in terms of um, uh, producing their, their products. So, uh, in this case, also working with, with Sobek um, was a kind of, you know, showing off. We had this 20-meter cantilever sort of flying over. Uh, the entrance here, and then uh, produced a, a curtain wall which wraps uh, around the building to produce a, a space for a kind of information counter and some uh, technical uh, spaces uh, around it. So that um, one of the things that we found when we started working for these guys was that they were already producing um, these kinds of things. These were um, used for uh, tabletops, which are laser uh, cut and then laser welded. Uh, so one of the questions when we're looking at these technologies is also scalability. Can you make these things bigger? Can you make them smaller? Uh, what happens uh, when you make these kinds of uh, adjustments uh, in systems that you find that are sort of outside of, of, of architecture? Um, the other thing we started to do with a project like this was to look at um, these um, diagrams that were coming. These were loading diagrams coming from Werner's office and to see um, if we could map this kind of information into the structure of this roof. So, um, so it's obviously about efficiencies, um, but it's also making um, the logic of, say, this kind of information um, legible or visible uh, in the architecture um, so that um, 
I mean, we're always looking for gaps, how to fill this gap between representing something and constructing it, so um, that these 1 to 50 models are, uh, in a sense, quite being constructed in a very uh, almost identical way to how the roof itself will be constructed at a scale of, of, of 1 to 1 until, you know, after going through a series of uh, testing of these, looking at um, a solution that, again, has this kind of variability uh, in the in the structural system that reflects the, the loading of you know compression tension and all the stuff in this 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 crazy um, roof um, that could be done this way um, as is in a lot of these systems there's there's systems that are integrated in, in this diagram was uh, looking how uh, lighting systems could work to fit into the kind of coffering spaces uh, of it and and contribute to that um, and then again going back to um, the mock-up, um, which is both a, a kind of visual mock-up, but, but also a performance one in terms of seeing all the parts that need to produce this. So some of these are, are laser cut. Um, these are also uh, changing in terms of depth and width, um, how systems like the gutters uh, can be integrated to this thing, what things are welded, which things are, are mechanically fastened uh, in this collective way to produce uh, this piece, for again, which is essentially a simple uh, pavilion here, um, which is wrapping this kind of information area and, and, and technical cores for, for this kind of cantilevered space. Um, uh, in this section showing the, um, this sort of gigantic concrete foundation so the whole thing doesn't just tip over um, and, and to produce it in a series of six segments. Um, also with the last project, uh, the question of staging or, or bringing this thing together in a, in a fairly quick uh, was about um, trucking these these prefabricated uh, strips uh, for the roof on site, and then and then sort of fastening these pieces together, uh, and then and then yanking them up into the air, and then sitting them on to these uh, four uh, uh, points. So um, it was also the aspect of, of um, theory and reality. So you have two thousand workers out here watching this thing, and then they set these things on the columns, and the thing bounces like a, a diving board about fifty centimeters up and down and then sort of slowly settled um, into, uh, into shape. Um, the other uh, sort of project uh, within this project was um, the, 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 the creation of, of the curtain wall here. Um, uh, like some of the earlier projects, it's a double facade. Um, it's entirely made of, of glass, um, but um, so that um, it's completely independent from the structure above it and the columns. It's, it's, it's like a 50 centimeter um, uh, glass and plexiglass uh, double wall that goes around it, but but also other systems from the the, the screens uh, up in the roof to the the gate screens here, which telescope and open in and produce um, a kind of um, ray effect. But this idea of a kind of uh, totally uh, worked out um, design in terms of the, the components that make up uh, the thing, I think. Um, I think we, we like to go back and look at, at history uh, from time to time. In this case, um, these are, are garden walls that are infilled with log. There was a way of um, in, uh, recreating that condition with, with uh, new materials, with modern materials. Um, either, even though we drew this um, digitally, um, it was constructed uh, by hand. This guy was completely pissed off, but he had to uh, glue each one of these pieces with a capillary glue to produce this thing. So. Again, I think there's, there's a huge amount of give and take in terms of, of how things are conceived and how they're executed in the actual reality uh, on the ground of, of simply getting things uh, done to produce that. So um, like some of these other projects, I think it has a kind of visual effect in terms of making these walls uh, at the same time trying to see what else we can tease out of these systems in terms of, say, uh, sunscreening or how it would affect the climate uh, within this um, relatively small space and, and working out technical details, which uh, we have a lot of fun doing. Uh, in this case, this kind of gasket condition at the top of the blazing, it allows this very um, brittle facade to coexist with this very dynamic roof. When it snows, it can move uh, up and down in relationship to it. So, um, so in doing this, it, there's a series of kinds of problem solving uh, that goes around a project like this in terms of opportunity and how things um, get get fixed. 
Um, this idea of liminal surface um, is a, a series of uh, a series of projects where um, another area which almost seems like a site within uh, architecture itself is the um, uh, facade making, both in terms of, say, relationship to energy, uh, but also architecture uh, and structure as, as a kind of, almost sometimes a kind of independent site where um, often we have much more freedom uh, in terms of, or in relationship to, say, uh, office buildings where you're generating usable floor space, this kind of thing, um, as a place where we can um, work um, fairly intensely. Uh, this project uh, is at the DMC uh, in Seoul, Korea. We had never worked in Asia before. Um, we were very curious about uh, how we could uh, situate a building in here um, after we were used to working in Europe with these highly historical um, sites or um, very specific sites in terms of context. Uh, Seoul was a place that um, you know, we came sort of fresh to uh, that had these kinds of um, aspects about it. And we were asking how we could produce um, a building there that, in a sense, was fairly autonomous, that how it could react to a context that was not there or a context that was emerging. Um, so we thought we could really do this with, with a kind of facade and started producing these mock-ups um, in our courtyard out of reflected uh, mylar and, and discovered that in a very, very shallow uh, surface we could produce an enormous amount of, of reflection, almost like a uh, kaleidoscope, uh, in, in, in a fairly uh, easy, flat depth. So, uh, so here you can see the, the, the project here uh, in this so-called digital media city between the center and the airport, uh, where the city here is, is literally being constructed from right to left. These are um, empty lots that by now are probably filled up um, that could react to this context or these surrounding buildings um, in, a, in a kind of spectacular way. Uh, the idea of liminal being uh, the facade is a kind of mediator between a, a, a really, you know, very private interior um, offices and showrooms and, you know, extremely public uh, exterior in terms of people working here, people living here, people moving around and somehow reacting. So that even though it has this kind of non-public interior, um, the facade somehow would offer um, a kind of effect to both sides of that uh, um, surface or equation in a way. Um, we began to look at, at systems for um, articulating that uh, facade through patterns, through limits of glass. Uh, it's a low E Viacran uh, glass from the States uh, fitted to um, frames that are cut uh, on site by um, the Koreans. Uh, we were sort of joking about doing this here because this, it was a project that we could easily do in Germany, but um, often, uh, you know, wouldn't want to do um, because it would be complex, it would be, um, it would be difficult. The, the Koreans had no idea how to produce this thing, but were extremely keen and, and in a sense, teaching themselves how to um, use these to tools to produce a facade uh, system. Um, and in terms of digital drawing this thing, the, the systems and patterns, we would go back to um, uh, simple wood models in our shop to understand connections, how to make them simple and how to set a kind of uh, test um, piece or one module uh, for the building, uh, which could be either three-dimensional as it is here. Uh, you could flip it on its top to produce uh, a, another type. Uh, it could be 2D also uh, to, um, to save money, um, to change the pattern in the system, and then just took off-the-shelf uh, extrusions, aluminum extrusions, and then took uh, a German CNC machine and started uh, to cut these pieces and then coupled them with uh, these sort of joint stiffeners uh, to hold the geometry together and to pull the piece together. So again, uh, by working with uh, Allotech, uh, our local facade uh, company, we could produce uh, these frames. Uh, we brought in uh, this guy, Jerry, from, from RX in Hong Kong, who would do uh, sort of workshops with these guys in terms of producing it. Uh, so again, you have, you know, very, um, you know, higher technology for cutting these pieces and then uh, just very simple hand kitting uh, of the, the silicone joints to um, uh, close the piece uh, itself. Uh, and then again, uh, the mock-up, uh, in this case, uh, uh, wind and, and uh, rain tested the thing up to a kind of typhoon strength to see if it would work. Um, we got the green light to go ahead on this thing and then very quickly went into a series of production uh, runs in terms of producing the pieces, bringing them out on site, uh, 
lifting these things up. Sometimes they're quite quite huge, uh, and then moving them into place, uh, producing this kind of um, effect on the interior, uh, a kind of lacy or kind of lattice a structure of, of transparent glass and uh, translucent glass uh, in these sort of slivers of, of where the, the geometry is quite quite extreme uh, to, to produce open um, loft-like um, spaces um, that would change over the day. So depending on um, the time of day or, or the weather or, or people moving by uh, the project, you would um, uh, have a, a, a facade that in a sense is um, constantly changing um, and constantly transforming uh, over the day uh, through the seasons. Uh, being from the window washers are insane, by the way. Um, as this thing is is is, is used, um, there was other features of the of the construction, yeah, including um, these kind of barn doors uh, that we could produce for it. Uh, the idea of a, of a, of a deeper facade, uh, a kind of spatial depth at the entrance, which is punched uh, further in. Or, or specific uh, engineering projects such as this um, suspended stair and, and lobby wall, but kind of um, focus on selective features within uh, what in the end of the day is a kind of mid-sized corn shell uh, uh, building. Um, uh, we didn't get a patent for this project either, and uh, with six, within six months it was built in downtown Seoul uh, as a boutique, so uh, we need to talk about patents later, I think. Um, in terms of continuing this, this idea of, of facade uh, making, uh, this is a project uh, we also did with Transwar uh, for as a competition which we won uh, about 10 minutes right before the financial crisis uh, for a new corporate headquarters uh, for Daimler uh, in Stuttgart near their new museum from UN Studio. Um, but to try to use, um, in this case, uh, ideas about um, sustainability uh, as a principal driver for the kind of spatial and formal decisions for the building. So um, similar to some of these other approaches, I think this idea of, of, of the wind, uh, of, of maximizing southern and northern exposures in the, the building. Um, can you read that at all? Yeah. Um, also um, generating a series of, of atriums, stacked atriums on the north side where we don't have um, much uh, problem with sunscreening and uh, important for Daimler uh, was also this idea of communication where the atriums actually become a series of pockets on that north side that allow working groups kind of visual communication openness uh, within uh, again a kind of office building uh, uh, building typology. Um, the other idea that was important also I think politically for for a company like Daimler is that this, this technology is visible um, that it shows um, that they are after a kind of Leeds Platinum building, um, so that they have an entire, like a, an acre of these uh, photovoltaic cells on the, on the south facade, uh, which also can flip, they can move, they can uh, then uh, produce the sunscreen for the spaces in the inside. So uh, not, again, as something added on, but for something that can actually generate uh, all of the power for the entire building, uh, as well as the sunscreen for the spaces inside, um, something that um, would um, show a kind of interest and commitment uh, in, a, in a very sort of direct and physical way uh, for their company and the kind of working spaces uh, in this kind of standalone high-rise building uh, in an industrial area of, of, of Stuttgart. Um, another example of this kind of uh, looking at, at these kind of high-rise buildings is this one for um, um, Total, which are on site with now by the main uh, train station uh, in uh, Berlin. Over here, this piece is a, a, a tower uh, for uh, a new um, master plan, one of the last remaining parcels that are open uh, in Berlin, uh, where again there's a, there's a kind of extreme focus on the, uh, on the facade here as um, a load bearing uh, facade which spans the plates. Uh, span back to the, the core um, that has this sort of visual and, and, and kind of heaviness of, of a frame which is about creating more closed surface uh, on this thing that is all can be done uh, through a series of, of precast um, elements that we can sort of sandwich and connect back to 
um, the structure, but in a way, a fairly um, simple idea for a, a developer uh, building uh, where, in this case, we have a partner um, which can produce um, prefabricated concrete elements, um, which is, again, something we've tried to bring closer to uh, a digital capacity in terms of having many, many different elements. I think we have about 70 uh, unique types. Uh, some are repetitive, but many, many of these pieces are um, unique, uh, and that we could get a, a really high level of, of precision uh, into these pieces that can be added uh, into this um, system and then uh, um, be produced to produce uh, this facade here, uh, which in this case is for a German um, uh, certificate, a silver certificate for sustainability. Uh, and again, what would we would see as a kind of everyday uh, building type uh, that we've been working on. Um, the smart materials, let me know if I get too crazy with the time here, but uh, as we're getting into the afternoon. Uh, the smart materials project uh, was another exercise where um, in the context of the German EVA project, which has um, been around for 80 years in terms of new ideas for housing stock, um, we, we won a, a wholesome uh, global award a couple days ago for this um, project, but was to start with um, two materials that we wouldn't normally think about using uh, together and to combine them uh, to produce um, low-income housing uh, in Williamsburg, which is a, a kind of suburb of, of Hamburg, uh, out uh, past the, the water. Uh, a historical interest from our side was uh, this plate building or Plattenbau. So this is uh, Khrushchev uh, in 57 looking at how these uh, mass housing stock uh, was produced in, in Eastern uh, Europe across the board. Uh, we knew from these types that you could produce um, uh, lots of re repetition to these things, but uh, always had, again, this kind of built-in variability to them. So uh, what we did is we, we went through this whole chart of possible materials that we could afford for a project like this. And then uh, this is their sort of CO2 uh, output, um, ending up selecting, um, um, for us, a, a sort of strange combination of, of, of wood construction um, with infralight concrete, which is this um, uh, prefabricated lightweight concrete uh, where we can use uh, glass, recycled glass, uh, as a kind of aggregate for it, uh, which means it's a self-insulated um, material, uh, and then to combine it um, with these wood decks. Um, one of the things, I mean, one of the, uh, the sort of abilities that we relied on was uh, our, our fabrication, in this case for form work, uh, to produce um, uh, a building uh, component that could sort of multitask in this form. Um, it would spatialize in a certain way, but it's also a kind of self-supporting um, element. Um, it's uh, homogenous. Um, there's no extra finishes. Uh, we could run uh, coils through it for heating and cooling. Um, you could flip it upside down and get a different type. You could pour it at different levels. Um, so it's fairly easy. Uh, and then to use it as a kind of building block uh, to um, start to produce these four plates uh, where one four plate could work independently from the other and then structurally almost like a house of cards uh, you could allow these pieces to stack uh, over each other um, so that the model, this large model, is, is built exactly like uh, it will be built uh, in reality. Uh, and then uh, a huge amount of difference between openings and, and closings and stacking uh, without these kind of problems of cold bridges uh, by having a kind of uh, self-insulating, uh, self-insulated uh, material that could produce uh, both exterior, a kind of deep facade, deep space facade in terms of um, balconies uh, to the exterior uh, and then to the interior, uh, also strongly defined. Um, um, also important was the, the idea of, of staging this project. Obviously, all these pieces could be precasted. We could bring them by truck to the site and, and within uh, a number of days uh, stack these pieces uh, together and have the rough construction done within um, like a week or two. Um, the interiors uh, could produce these open loft spaces here. Uh, if we had to, um, we could um, divide or separate these spaces into smaller individual rooms. But um, uh, the idea of uh, a project that's extremely flexible, both in terms of its kind of interior layout, but also uh, a project that could adapt 
um, to different kinds of sites. Um, and then uh, within these phases of, of the, the wholesome prize, uh, use the, the prize money from the first stage of the competition to produce uh, a one-to-one -one prototype of the actual material uh, in a shop near us to, uh, to demonstrate all the things that this stuff could do and, 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 and to be much more precise about the economics of, of what these things would cost and how you could uh, collect, collect these into um, a, a building uh, project. Um, this also sort of sponsored uh, an idea for a project for us for the future, uh, which would be uh, a wooden high-rise over 20 stories. Uh, in this case, a wood construction, which we're getting uh, closer to be able to do or realize. In this case, um, combined with a very simply broken um, infralight concrete that, that acts as a low-bearing wall on the exterior uh, to produce this. So going between uh, projects, um, in, in a very recent project, and this uh, so-called cultural transformation is a project we opened two weeks ago in Marrakesh, an installation for their uh, Biennale. Uh, for us, the question here was, um, even though we conceived and we drew this project in Berlin, how could we um, translate um, a kind of um, geometrically conceived project uh, on site uh, in Marrakesh uh, through local materials, local um, crafts, which was um, uh, quite uh, exciting. Um, part of the other idea of this project was um, the, a mandate for the Biennale was um, that it would open up spaces that were before closed uh, to the people in the communities who live around here in Marrakesh as well as the tourists who are through here, um, both above ground uh, as well as, uh, as underground in these cisterns in uh, Finneborg's Peterson's project uh, here and then uh, see how we could translate this into a kind of structural process. So even though I think at, at the site it works as a kind of inst installation scale project, um, um, I think we're, we're constantly thinking about what kind of life that thing could have after the, the event or the Biennale or how it could work for us also as, as a prototype. So um, this is us studying models in our, in our practice in terms of um, rule geometry, a hyperbolic uh, structure, uh, and then seeing how that could marry or be um, attached to a kind of local uh, technique, in this case, a kind of weaving systems uh, in relationship to a, a frame, uh, and how that could um, be made. So, and, and, and just bringing, the, there's no, um, uh, Greg, there's no um, uh, iPhone app for this one. It's just simply um, getting the stuff on site and, and, and putting it up. So, and, and working with some of the, the local guys, Crespin, uh, in Marrakesh, who um, totally understood the system very well, were able to make suggestions, um, simplify it, um, and, and put the whole project up really quickly within um, like a week and a half, two weeks, um, where it's simply um, uh, wooden poles, uh, very precise steel fasteners that they produced in their shops down there, and, and uh, a kind of uh, wood, uh, cotton uh, wool that goes through here. So. In, in a way, the, the, the kind of beauty of a project like this, I think, is um, you know, site-specifically locating it, but um, the, the imprecision of its actual making, uh, in a way, improved everything that we could draw perfectly and think about perfectly in terms of geometry and relationships. But that sort of filter through um, the actual craft making of it was, um, for us, really astonishing, and, and how it created these transparencies and opacities, and you could just simply take these pans and put a bunch of rocks in here and you hold the whole thing together. So that, that, that ad hoc versus um, a highly precise um, design process was, was a, an outcome of this project um, that was extremely exciting for us as we work in places like Korea or Marrakesh or Germany or America. Um, the, the opportunities and, and the limits between projects um, are, are really interesting and despite this idea of globalization and sameness, um, it, it's not so. And, and because of that, I think it, it, gives, it helps texture the work and it differentiates the work for us in a really uh, compelling uh, way. And um, I, just, I think I'm almost done here. I have a couple images. Um, so, which is to say that we, we continue to, to look forward and to, to, to look at um, uh, different ways of doing things so that, again, uh, the, the, the practice itself continues to evolve uh, it, it continues to change. Uh, we continue to teach um, 
what we do when we're teaching now is we work closely with uh, industry. This is an example uh, of a project uh, with a, a client from BMW, Chris Bangle, the head of a design who had come up with the Gina concept uh, for a, a, a kinetic uh, fabric uh, surface on cars. He could skin these cars extremely quickly, uh, very lightly, very economically in terms of material and energy. Um, we asked ourselves how we could um, uh, use this for, for architecture uh, and how we could reduce, in this case, uh, housing uh, stock that could react to um, a, a kinetic architecture, kind of revisiting that, that, that old dream uh, in terms of how a program space can change, relationships can change, uh, new materials uh, that can do this, um, that keeps us going. So um, I'll finish with, with this image, but the idea of, of continuing uh, to search continuing to look for new ideas and continuing working in different formats. Thank you.